Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. There is a legend that dates back to the early days of filmmaking. The popular belief was that the lead actor had to be attractive in order for the film to be successful. One of the few people that fit this bill is Tyrone Power. The matinee idol enchanted his audience with not only his good looks but his acting abilities. He was unstoppable during the 1930s and 40s. His endearing demeanour continued to captivate the hearts of his audience until the end of his career. What was Tyrone Power's secret to earn $642.5 million? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Tyrone Power, the Matinee Doll Tyrone Power, the famed action-adventure film actor, was the third in his family to carry the mantle of the name Tyrone Power. However, Power's image as a skilled performer was undermined by the fact that he was not only a top leading man of the era, but also one who was repeatedly called both beautiful and handsome, as well as more disparaging terms like pretty boy and heartthrob by the press. Early in his career, he was portrayed as a celebrity to be gazed at, with framing and intense lighting urging us to concentrate on his face through a succession of lingering shots. Female characters fill in for the audience by staring at him, even if he does not reciprocate their gaze, and they frequently initiate a kiss as though they can't resist his macho magnetism. Despite his big physique, Power's athletic performances in films like The Mark of Zorro and Blood and Sand showed spectators another aspect of him that accentuated his macho, active body as he fences, uses a sword or rounds the bullring. Power's size also helped boost his career when he transitioned into more male-oriented genres like Western and military films. He also played age-appropriate roles as the kind of roles he played when he was in his early 20s, were no longer viable for him. Despite the fact that his films were used to demonstrate his physical abilities, they also showed his body in extremely tight-fitting costumes, justified by the plot, which helped to draw attention to not only his broad frame, but also his crotch and buttocks, giving Power's persona a sense of dangerous eroticism. His costumes in The Mark of Zorro and his absence of any shirt in Son of Fury, the story of Benjamin Blake, are particularly notable. Tyrone Power's family has a long history in the entertainment industry, dating back to his great-grandfather, an Irish comic, and his father, a silent cinema star. All three of Tyrone's children followed in his footsteps as an actor. His great-grandfather was born to a landed family in Kilmac Thomas, County Waterford, Ireland, where he rose to popularity as an actor and manager worldwide. His family relocated to Cardiff after his father's death, but his passion for the stage may have been spurred by a relationship with a relative who worked as a printer for local theatres. At the age of 14, Power ran away from home to pursue a career as an actor, beginning with small parts. Subsequently, he was well known for his roles in Irish-themed plays such as Catherine Gore's King O'Neill, his own St. Patrick's Eve, Samuel Lover's Rory O'More, and The White Horse of the Peppers, Anna Marie Hull's The Groves of Blarney, Eugene McCarthy's Charles O'Malley, Bale Bernard's His Last Legs, and Bale Bernard. Richard Allen Cave argues in his assessment of these works that our Tyrone Power intended to redeem the Irishman from unfavourable connections with stage Irishmen by both his acting and his choice of plays. By the time William Power was cast as the ludicrously titled Looney MacTwalter, the stage Irishman had become a comic mainstay, emotional, buffoonish and cowardly, but with a good nature that kept the audience sympathising with him. With his Irish ancestry, friendly, open demeanour and easy athleticism, Power looked ideal for the part. His performance, however, was so negatively received that he considered retiring from the theatre, which he did when his wife of two years, Anne Gilbert, came into some money later that year. They travelled to South Africa and stayed for a year, but Power could not settle. Still the stage beckoned and the couple returned to England, where Power began acting on the London stage. 
With the tragic death of the day's leading Irish comedian Charles Connor in 1926, while serving in supporting parts in Covent Garden, opportunity struck in a suitably dramatic fashion. Power stepped into his position to fill in the space Charles left, and from then on he specialised in Irish humorous roles in O'Shaughnessy, Coleman and Sheridan's works. William Power began writing in the 1830s, creating a variety of Irish comedies such as Married Lovers and How to Pay the Rent, Paddy Carney and St. Patrick's Eve, as well as romances with evocative titles like The Gypsy of Abruzzo. When the SS President vanished without a trace in the North Atlantic in April of 1841, Tyrone Power the Elder was lost at sea. Helen Emma, our very own Tyrone's mother, worked as a Shakespearean actress and dramatic coach, while his father was also a theatre star, just like his father. Tyrone Power Jr. was a sickly youngster when they gave birth to him, so his family had to relocate to Southern California, where the environment was warmer than where he was born. Sadly, his parents split in the autumn of 1920, and he and his sister Anne moved back to Cincinnati with their mother. Although he regularly corresponded with his father, who pushed him to pursue acting, the celebrity was primarily raised by his mother. Tyrone, despite his good looks, had a hard time finding work in Hollywood. He began with minor roles before progressing to theatre jobs. When he obtained a contract with 20th Century Fox in 1936, he finally broke through. He was already playing significant roles and was one of the company's top actors within a year. Tyrone had over 50 acting credits under his belt and established himself as an actor to watch. When Robert Taylor joined MGM in 1934, the studio advertised that it had more stars than there are in heaven, implying that Taylor would be competing for jobs with the studio's established leading men like Clark Gable and Robert Montgomery, as well as newcomers like James Stewart. 20th Century Fox, on the other hand, had only recently been founded when Power was hired in 1936. The result of a May 1935 merger between existing studios, Fox Film Corporation, and 20th Century Pictures. While William Fox founded Fox in 1915, the latter was founded in 1933 by Joseph Schenck and Zanuck, who worked at Warner Brothers before joining 20th Century as production chief. As a result, Power joined a studio that was still in its infancy, and far from being a great force it would become in the future. Shirley Temple, a little child actress, and Will Rogers, a middle-aged actor, were the most popular stars, but both had short careers because Temple was soon an adolescent, and Rogers died in a plane crash in 1935. Temple's popularity was exclusively responsible for Fox's survival throughout the Great Depression, according to Wheeler Winston Dixon. Still, she was quickly discarded when the Bluebird was a box office flop and lost a lot of money. Following that, the studio relied on Tyrone Power's dashing charisma and the lush beauties of Linda Darnell and Jean Tierney, who both co-starred with Power on multiple occasions. Even though MGM had the most extensive stable of male stars, 20th Century Fox relied on Power, Amesh and Henry Fonda as its main leading men with Schatz describing Power as the most crucial company asset, with Amesh and Fonda both supporting him on screen. Zanuck showed the entertainment industry the efficiency of the star system by launching a new generation of distinct star personas, including Power, Amesh, Alice Fay, and Sonia Henney. They all helped the company become one of Hollywood's most dominant studios. Furthermore, these four actors collaborated frequently throughout the late 1930s and early 1940s. Although Power's films with Fay were among his most remarkable, he was initially cast in forgettable features aimed to bolster emerging female stars, such as Fay, Henny and Loretta Young. Despite the fact that Young would become Power's most frequent co-star throughout the 1930s, her career began much earlier, in the silent era when she made her film debut as a kid in 1917. Young had almost 65 screen credits by the time she was teamed with Power in Ladies in Love, while it was only his fourth film and his first lead role. So despite arriving in Hollywood at the same time as Power, Faye established herself as a celebrity considerably more quickly. She was able to get Fox to cast him as her leading man in Sing Baby Sing. 
Power started filming, and images of the two on set for the film exist. However, Power was replaced by Michael Whelan after 20th Century Fox decided they needed a big name in the role. Whelan, who was 12 years older than Power, had only made five films before this, and despite working continuously until the 1960s, his fame never came close to matching Power, so it's safe to say Fox made a little error in judgment on that one. Power got a couple of awards for his acting prowess because he was pretty accomplished. Won Bambi Award for Best Actor, International for his roles in Rawhide and the Black Rose. He was honoured with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1960 as well. For his role in That Wonderful Urge and Prince of Foxes, he was nominated for another Bambi Award in the Best Actor, the International category, in 1951. 31 of the 43 films in which Power starred entered the top earners list, resulting in a profit of almost $69 million for the studio, equivalent to roughly $642.5 million now if we consider this amount at the end of his career. This translates to an average of $2.2 million per year over the 22 years, even after he was no longer under contract, or $4.6 million per year if only counting the 15 years he had a film on the top earners list. The actor was married three times. He married Annabella, an actress, on April 23, 1939. On January 26, 1948, they divorced without any children from the union. Annabella, on the other hand, had a daughter, Annie, whom Tyrone adopted and gave his last name. Linda Christian, his second wife, was an actress who starred in films such as Amore in Cato di Maria de Litti, How to Seduce a Playboy, and Murder in Amsterdam. On January 27, 1949, they married, and on August 7, 1956, they divorced. The couple had two children from the union, named Romina, who later published a book about her father and his acquaintances and Tarin. While appearing on Broadway in Bernard Shaw's Back to Methuselah in the spring of 1958, Power met a beautiful socialite named Deborah. Though originally from Mississippi, the raven-haired beauty, whom Power jokingly said resembled a female version of himself, had lived in Hollywood for several years. Power married Deborah Jean Smith Minardos on May 7, 1958. They remained together until November of the same year. Tyrone Power Jr. was their only child together, but Tyrone Power's relationship with Errol Flynn was the subject of rumours. All of these are just unsubstantiated rumours without any proof, though. The news of the actor's death shocked the world on November 15, 1958. The information that Tyrone Power had died rocked the actor's fans to their core. Power was said to have died of a heart attack while filming a fight scene with George Sanders for the film Solomon and Sheba. He passed away before reaching the hospital. People believe that Power was anxious or nervous because of the film he was shooting, which caused insufficient blood flow to the heart, resulting in a heart attack. Memorial services were held in Hollywood's Chapel of the Psalms on November 21st in Hollywood, California. He was laid to rest in Memorial Park Cemetery. Every year a memorial is held in his memory at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery on the 15th of November, the anniversary of his death. Obviously, he was very much loved by many. Tyrone Power was a one-of-a-kind individual. The dashing Tyrone Power was definitely the king of action-adventure movies of his time. He also did a few staged plays before his demise. Aside from acting, the star also served in the United States Marine Corps during World War II, an honourable deed that will be remembered. Although he is no longer alive, his soul lives on, and the roles he played will forever be a testimony of his superb acting abilities. Tyrone Power could have given the world so much more. I believe in one kind of immortality. People live in the world they leave behind. There are probably people who have passed away who have influenced you. So long as that influence remains, they are alive in you. Just because we happen to shuffle off this mortal coil and leave some worm food behind, we are not dead. So long as someone remains on earth whose life we have left some mark. Perhaps it was a way of expressing the significant impact his words had on her or a desire to share her father's insightful opinions on life and death in general, 
This quote came from the 1946 Screenland article, This is what I believe, allegedly written by Tyrone Power just after his return from war. It sets out in subsections, revealing the actor's thoughts on life, death, immortality and religion, presenting something more contemplative than the light fare one tends to associate with film fan magazines. However, given that Power had just returned to Hollywood after active duty in the Marine Corps during World War II, these subjects take on a particularly dark and sombre tone in the pen or typewriter of Power. His concerns with leaving a mark and living in those left behind are apt, showing in the things he set out to achieve and the lives he touched till his last breath. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. But stars could not only turn a profit for Hollywood studios, they could also spend, and spend big. Watch this video and find out how Gloria Swanson spent $250 million a week.